type of a business now <clears throat> between mobile payments, mobile marketing, and advertising. And in fact, we kind of overlap both. So when we were talking with Marla about how to kind of shape the show and uh, drive things forward and engage more directly with retailers, uh, I thought it would also be important to kind of talk about maybe at the next level down what some of the products are. So you'll see in here a reference to the wallets that we all talked about this morning. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about how the different pieces fit. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about marketing, beaconing. And if you'd like some demos later, we can do that in the back of the room as well. And then a little video at the end. So that's the agenda. I have 31 slides and probably about 28 minutes now. So we'll, we'll see how far we get. <clears throat> so I thought we'd start out with the Wikipedia version of uh, the definition of mobile commerce. And I've had this debate with a lot of different people. So what is mobile commerce? Is a square solution mobile commerce where you're doing something on a mobile phone? Is shopping on a iPad mobile commerce or e-commerce? Uh, in my mind, and according to the definition, anything that involves a mobile device is mobile commerce, which means it's wide open. So everything we've talked about with offline, online, in-store, and the fact that people use their phones while they're in the store, while they're at home, while they're shopping, while they're sitting at the babysitter waiting to pick up their kids uh, on a mobile device is all mobile commerce. So some of the past conversations we've been hearing about the separation of the two, uh, in my mind, mobile commerce, whether you're paying online or paying through a card on file or buying through a website using a mobile device, is mobile commerce. Smartphones, we've talked a lot about smartphones all day. Uh, the fact is, everybody has them, everybody's using them. Interestingly enough, 17% of uh, smartphone users actually make mobile payments. So now, does that mean they have to pay through an NFC wallet, or are they simply making a purchase on their, on their iPad to, to, to buy something? And I think that uh, that number is actually higher if you use that definition. Again, as everybody said, if you leave your wallet at home, I think was the reference this morning, would you go back for it? If you left your phone at home, you clearly would, uh, to the point that uh, everyone is on their phone constantly. Data usage is projected to be about three and a half gigs per person. I may already be there. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, given the day or the fact that we're using uh, mobile phones today to drive the web, I think we, uh, we all depend on mobile very directly. <clears throat> mobile payments market. So now, shifting specifically to payments, and I put payments in here first because this is the mobile payments show. Even though mobile commerce is a broader definition of mobile payments, I wanted to dive into the payment side of things first. So mobile payments market is projected to be about $617 billion by 2016, about two years from now. And as I understand it, the market is today about a trillion dollars in general. Uh, so the question really is, is, is everything we're doing today moving towards mobile, the lines blur between what we do today through an online shopping environment, through a, a mobile device, uh, in-store, all of those things begin to come together where I think at the end of the day, uh, mobile and shopping become one and the same, or at least the money we spend. Uh, a couple of other points on here, probably the last one, uh, which is interesting. Uh, how many people have used a mobile device in a store? 41%. That's a pretty good number. But we heard this morning uh, also uh, about Best Buy and, and uh, showrooming and whatnot. Certainly people are using it to compare. And there are some very deliberate strategies you can use to kind of drive uh, a better uh, customer interaction and also to maybe uh, shorten or eliminate some of those uh, showrooming opportunities. So how are smartphones and tablets used for payments today in the market? And this is a cross-section. Um, you know, I looked at the numbers, and, and I believe that NFC and some of the other numbers may be a little higher in this chart than what I believe they are in the US. I don't really know the source of this, um, whether or not this is, uh, well, it says US market, US payments. 
uh, but I'm not really sure what the source data is. The point is, though, is, is that mobile payments are on the rise, and in fact, again, depending on how you count it, uh, are being done every day uh, via a cell phone. So here's where I thought I'd do things a little bit different, and certainly being a company that's in the processing business, uh, we're an aggregator, very much like Square and PayPal. Uh, we, do, uh, we, we provide processing services for small and larger retailers. And the question always comes up, so what does Apple Pay mean to your business? What does Apple Pay mean in general? Is Apple going to take over the world? And I think the answer really is, is we don't really know yet, uh, but probably not. Apple, certainly in the momentum and, and the things that have come behind it, with it, uh, the news that, that goes along with the, uh, with the whole release is great for all of us that are in the business of mobile. But I thought I'd start out with a very basic chart. And on all of the slides I provided, I've given you references, all this stuff's out on the internet. But uh, Fidelity Payments had a very nice, simple diagram that explained how payments worked. So uh, being a good payments guy, 17 years at First Data, on the issuing side and the acquiring side, there's a lot of details that happen in payments. Most of you in the room probably know that. The point is, though, is on the very simple face of things, um, consumer walks in with an Apple-enabled device and wants to make a payment. What really happens behind the scenes? Well, in phase one with NFC, I think we all kind of know how that works. Phase two of, of Apple Pay um, and some of their different protocols, I think the promise is that'll be out here later this month. We'll get a little bit more detail on exactly how it works. I think we all generally know, but specifically we don't. But the point is, is that all of the wallets, and I'm gonna run through them again, um, as we did this morning, are on the left side of the diagram. And all of us in the retail merchant, merchant acquiring, is on the right side of the diagram. So if a consumer wants to buy something, they're gonna walk in with their device, and they're gonna present it to their merchant, and their merchant processing partner will process the payment, and there'll be a discount rate, just like there is today. There'll be payment processing fees. And the right side of the equation will generally function business as usual. Prices may be a little bit different. Uh, there may be other incentives to go along with it. But at the end of the day, the process, the network, the infrastructure doesn't change, right? It is adapting slowly. I think there's some good opportunities for some evolution. Maybe we jump over EMV at some point. Uh, maybe something new comes out next week, who knows? And again, it's a very good market to be in, right? News every day. But uh, the transaction flow process is fairly complicated, and, uh, and there's a lot of hands that are in that process that will stay embedded and are really necessary to, to ensure that the processing uh, stream, the security, protection of data all stays in place. All right, so the wallets. We'll run through these pretty quickly. As we talked about, Apple Pay, it is a, an issuer-based play. That's why uh, the, the deal was cut with the, uh, the different issuing banks. Softcard, we heard about that this morning as well, ISIS. Uh, also with uh, Google Pay, which has really been around for two years. I know I have a, a Samsung phone that has, uh, has the Google Pay NFC wallet in it, which I've never used. MCX, which is up and coming. Target, Best Buy, some of the others, actually are now trying to put together, and I only took one screenshot. There's about four of the screens with the different brands that are partnering, which is interesting because now it becomes a merchant-driven payment infrastructure that potentially shifts a bit the priorities of that payment network to things that are more valuable to the merchant and maybe the merchant's consumers rather than to the banks or the networks. And by the way, in the US, every payment process has a bank behind it because that's the US law. So all of these different uh, processes at the end of the day are still sponsored by a bank. And this is the currency app that they have. I did not realize that the currency app was a standalone app, but I do know and we've applied to be a partner uh, to, uh, to, to uh, engage in the currency side. And Spindle's main business is providing services mostly to the next tier down of merchants. So if you think about the targets, the best buys of the world, who are all doing great things, but they also have good infrastructure, they've got a good budget, and they're investing, what about the retailers, the restaurants, and all the guys that are the next tier down? There's companies like us, hopefully, that will be out there helping. 
probably not at the same level. The sophistication of the solution won't be there. But the idea is, is that if e-commerce or mobile commerce is going to take off, it can't be the top 5%. It needs to be everybody, every consumer, every merchant. And that means that there's a lot of business opportunity to get out and to help with these solutions. All right. Payments are important, but I think the point was made earlier by Bill with this little dot that said payments are a very small piece of what happens in the market today. So the premise is, is that while payments are important, they close the loop or finish the transaction, it has to start somewhere, and generally that means with marketing. Offers, coupons, announcements, something that happen to, uh, to drive a consumer to want to purchase or choose a particular good. I thought I'd also start out with the point that uh, since so many merchants or so many consumers are out shopping in store, that many retailers don't realize that their consumers are in the store looking at goods and services and looking on their website for information about that product. So we need to pay attention, and this is again the comment on Omnichannel, to make sure that all the silos are aligned, that somebody with a mobile device standing in your store can get information on that mobile device while they're shopping or they'll go to another site. The uh, spend today on digital is now 37%. It is the largest segment. Uh, it has now surpassed TV advertising, although some might argue that TV advertising is more effective today, and, uh, and I think the stats prove that, but I think that will change over time. And that over time, the uh, mobile spending or mobile advertising spend grows considerably, and I guess all of the charts really indicate uh, that the growth opportunities is really there. Distribution of ad spending today, again, much like the previous slide, indicates the shift from traditional to a more digital market. And consumers in store are using their mobile devices uh, on a very regular basis. So this is, again, a uh, cross-section of uh, folks who have used their phone in store in the past 30 days, and I think we've all done it. So I think the numbers are very believable. All right. So now there's some new technology, NFC being one, although it's not that new. NFC was formerly called RFID and other kinds of things in the past. But uh, BLE, or Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, is uh, the beacons, uh, iBeacons is a good example of that, are now out. And I found a nice infographic that was out there from Fierce uh, Mobile that kind of give a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. And I thought that that would be interesting. If you look at the graphic on the very bottom, you have a coverage type of an approach versus a point-to-point. -point. And that's probably the primary difference between the two technologies. And their main purposes are slightly different as well. So uh, BLE, and this is just a chart uh, that compared the two, is really uh, one-to-many, meaning it's a broadcast tool. Uh, and NFC is more of a one-to-one, -one, tap and go. So the idea with the Bluetooth is uh, that you walk into a store, much like GPS, it can alert your phone that you are now crossing into, nearing a zone, whatever the case might be, and your phone can then take action as a result of passing into that Bluetooth signal. Here's a, a picture of two different types of, of uh, beacons. Uh, the one on the left is the Estimote beacon. I think that's the same one that may be used for, for the iBeacons with, with Apple. It's uh, the same one we're using as well. And uh, April Beacon is another uh, manufacturer. I think there's three or four now uh, that are out there. And literally, the beacons are about the size of a CR2032 battery, which is what you see on that left picture. And they transmit, in some cases, for a year, some cases for multiple years. The point is, you stick them on the side of a building or on the side of your uh, store or maybe in a rack or in an area or department, and you just let them run. Ideally, as things progress, there will be some opportunities to better drive uh, store in-store decisions based on beacons, and we can, we'll talk about that here momentarily. So with beacon market emerging, and emerging quickly, and certainly uh, Lord & Taylor now we know is doing a beacon program with Swirl. Uh, we also heard uh, uh, the guys at uh, Shopkick uh, doing their deal with Macy's and about 4,000 beacons being deployed. In each one of those cases, there's a couple of interesting things to note. First of all, the stores chose to use the national marketing network rather than their own, their own app. 
And there's a reason for that, I believe. And secondly, that in each one of these cases, they did a very simple initial step, which is simply to deliver some content or a coupon upon walking into the store. So first of all, why would a, a, a retail brand like Macy's not use their Macy's app? Well, now they have to get apps out in the hands of all of their consumers, get the consumers to, to download those apps, turn them on when they walk into a Macy's store, or they can leverage a network like Shopkick where the consumers already have an embedded base, they already have the reach, they already have the infrastructure and management component. Whether or not that will stay that way in the long run, it's hard to say, but I've been generally of the opinion that it is better for the consumers and the merchants to have a pool to, pool, to pull from rather than trying to do individual branded solutions. So in other words, if I'm going to walk into Macy's, I have to remember, hold on, got to load my Macy's app so I can get the coupon before I walk in. Some people will do that. Uh, more likely, if I'm walking the mall, I'm not going to open every app as I get to each su successive store. If I can leverage uh, an infrastructure that's there and the pricing is right, uh, the national branded networks uh, will, will actually win. So what are the challenges? With Beacons, there's a lot of challenges. There's things that we don't really know yet, uh, things that we're testing. Uh, we have uh, seven different retailers working with us as well on some Beaconing pilots. And the question always is, when do I do it? How do I do it? How fast? How frequent? Uh, what do I do about privacy? Can I get information? Can I send information? And, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, what we don't want to do is to overburden the consumer with too many disruptions, too many beacons, too many hits, too many coupons. Because as the research indicated, and we heard it again this morning, consumers don't turn off Bluetooth. They delete the app. And uh, then uh, that kind of defeats the purpose in general. So these are the things that all of us in the business of beaconing are trying to, to grapple with. What is the right way to deliver it? And what is the right frequency? What do you do when somebody's in the store? They walk out, maybe they go to the restroom, they come back into a department. How do you manage people moving in and out of these different beacon regions without being overly burdened? Another good example too, I'm in the mall. I am shopping today. I'd love to get coupons, offers, announcements. But uh, uh, next weekend, I'm going to the movie theater with my wife. We're simply walking through the mall. How do I know when that merchant or that consumer is simply passing through versus simply looking to go shop? And maybe I want to deliver some coupons, maybe I don't. So we have to all sort that out. And I think the algorithms, just like they are today in the distribution side of mobile advertising, will get better on a pull side of mobile marketing to, uh, to a consumer. All right, so we're going to get tricky here and see if this will work. I was going to show you some videos, or actually maybe what I'll do here is walk to the back. So the question is, is there's a couple different kinds of beacon uh, uh, schemes that one might have. Certainly we all understand uh, providing a coupon to a customer, but a beacon can be used to trigger a lot of different things. So since we're all in Chicago, uh, I thought it would be interesting to see what might happen when you came to the baggage claim department of O'Hare Airport, and your phone popped up a little message, and you received this. This is a rich media video that gives With information. With all due respect to home, there's no place like Chicago. This is, after all, a city where people once got together and reversed the flow of a river. A city that started rebuilding itself before the embers of the great fire had even stopped glowing. And a city that thumbed its nose at the glaciers that flattened it by building towering mountains of steel and glass. In Chicago, impossible is a noun and nothing more. This is, after all, a place of no small plans, or medium-sized ones for that matter. Here, you don't have to search for inspiration. You run into it on almost any corner. Indeed, the entire city seems to be a monument to man's potential. A place where the best and the brightest become even better and shine even brighter. OK, so in the interest of not taking another minute of time here, uh, that was a good welcome video. Uh, we actually have one of our pilots uh, which is a retail location inside of a retail location that is looking to do something like this to attract people to come to their venue uh, within that larger retail environment. 
So again, beacons don't have to be about giving coupons out. They don't have to be about special deals, but they can be about information. So we talked this morning, or we heard uh, uh, Dee from uh, uh, Best Buy talking a bit about showrooming. And here's another good example of something that could be done while you're shopping. You walk up to a TV or you're in the Hi, TV my name section. Is Sony, and because I'm part of the training department, people are always asking me to show them why they should buy a Sony television set. So what I have behind me is a Sony KDL W802 and the competitive Samsung television set. And I'm going to quickly show you the difference between these TV sets and how it affects picture quality. The video you're about to see is taken directly off of the camera. And to make it easy for you to replicate these results, all of the tests are done using identical USBs with identical content loaded on them. For this test, both television sets have been reset to factory conditions right out of the box. And we're using the television set's preset picture modes. The reason why we're using the preset picture modes is because this is the way most of you are going to be watching your TVs. Now, some of the issues I'm going to show you can be calibrated out. All right, you get the point. The point is that uh, now we have a rich media, uh, a way of, of presenting uh, difficult technical information to a consumer. Imagine something similar to this being done in a home theater section of a, uh, of a business or, or of a uh, uh, large retailer uh, where the information can be presented by, uh, by a very good professional video uh, with a lot of information. The last example on here uh, as well is that a beacon can trigger something uh, to take you to a website. Uh, we were also, uh, and you've heard, a lot of people have heard uh, the, uh, the old scenario of check-in. I walk into uh, to the Doubletree Hotel, my phone is triggered uh, by the beacon in the lobby, um, my room key is downloaded to my passbook, and I'm directed to go straight to my room. I, th I think those kinds of things are just around the corner. I know that there are some hospitality groups already working on solutions like that. So beacons really represent a great opportunity to more deeply engage with consumers and to really drive uh, things uh, more efficiently and more professionally. Last item uh, that I thought would be interesting as I walk back to the front here, and something that uh, I don't think a lot of people are aware of either, is there are a company in particular that's on the website here uh, that has a solution that, uh, much like the, uh, the app that would recognize a song and help you identify it, are working on technologies now to identify products. So now a consumer can go in, be beacon triggered, uh, or just shopping in general, and scan an item and bring up product information. It's all done through different, different kinds of recognition. This is real, I've seen a demo of it. And so, again, another way of enhancing a shopping experience through a mobile device. So I think you'll see more about this, uh, much like uh, they're doing with MCX. They're trying to put together an alliance of retailers. So mobile is really here, and that's really kind of the point of the next slide. Um, hang on here, maybe. Thank you. Well, I didn't have it in full view mode, so my clicker's not working. All the way to the end, it'd be great. I think we did pretty good on 31 slides, huh? All right, so the question, uh, the topic of this particular session is, have we reached tipping point in mobile commerce? I, I guess I would argue not quite yet, but I think we're making a very good progress towards that. Mobile commerce, again, isn't just about payment. It isn't just about marketing. It's about a consumer's experience. It's about, where's Bill? I think he may be gone now. It's about omnichannel, honestly. But omnichannel, not in the sense that the consumer realizes what they're doing, but their interaction now with a brand is seamless, right? And that's what we're all after. So uh, conclusions. Mobile's here. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Consumers are ready. Merchants are not. That's one I haven't heard yet today, and generally speaking, I think that's the case. It doesn't say that it's easy for merchants to get engaged, but generally speaking, a consumer with a mobile phone is ready to engage and has, for the most part, the tools to do so, but the merchants are not. And mobile commerce is complex and, uh, and immature. Certainly, beaconing is immature when it comes to the technology and the science behind it. So uh, what we've been encouraging our customers to do is to start simple, get some experience, start out. Try a few things. And I think that was the theme we've heard today here as well. 
uh, certainly with Target, uh, Best Buy, and everyone else on the panel, people are doing things, they are having some success, and we're making some mistakes along the way, but this allows us to, to better uh, learn and perfect and protect uh, really the, uh, uh, the privacy and, and, the, uh, and respect uh, the interruptions for our, our customers. And that's it, this is my commercial. We're in the back, we'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. So how, much, how am I doing on time? Okay, so questions, comments? We go from there or come see me in the back, it's up to you guys. Yes? So certainly you saw that I pulled that off of a website and in a lot of cases, so one of the one of the things I was trying to do today is to kind of give people a very base understanding of some of the technologies, right? Because people believe, well, you can do all of this with NFC, or you can do all of this with BLE, and they're different technologies. Um, I also believe that they have to work together, right, in order to, to have a good experience. That doesn't mean a BLE beacon can't trigger an MCX type transaction that has nothing to do with NFC. Uh, and it doesn't mean that NFC can't be used to store a, a, a passcode or do other kinds of things. But generally speaking, NFC is, is primarily today for payment and, and other things that are stored in it. And BLE is generally used to, to, to kick off an event, right? So I simply tried to contrast some technology, hopefully successfully. <laughs> other questions? No? All right. Yes. So the question was, are POS platforms today generally suited and uh, for, for these kinds of new transactions? And I think to the point earlier about uh, uh, merchants not being ready, generally speaking, they are not. I think the, uh, the evolution is underway. And I know I've spoken to a few folks here that are in the business of helping merchants with their point of sale platforms. Uh, but this is where I think um, announcements like Apple Pay do a great deal in helping accelerate the process and that evolution at the point of sale. I will tell you that at uh, First Data, I managed uh, a, the product called DataWire, and I know some of the folks in here know what that is. And it literally took us two years, <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, to get some of the point of sale platforms engaged and to begin to move to an IP-based uh, scenario instead of dial-up. So while I don't think it may take two years here, certainly uh, evolution at the point of sale is a slow process in uh, maybe in mobile terms uh, or in, uh, in, in a mobile timeline. But it is happening. Uh, certainly solutions like we have in the back with a tablet-based POS uh, accelerate that. And uh, some of the research indicates that some of the smaller merchants will be moving tablet, skipping over uh, some of the other solutions. So. Um, the answer, generally no, merchants aren't ready, but I think that at least everybody's paying attention. Thank you very much.